We will start our recording now. And uh, again, welcome um, to the webinar on uh, water audit validation. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to introduce this topic to you. If you're a member of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, you know that we're very interested in this topic. We've been very active in water loss work for a number of years. We consider it consider it a big priority for water utilities in the management of their systems. Um, and we do a lot of work. We participate in committees at both the, the uh, national level and also international level. Uh, we've done project work where we've done um, working with project partners doing uh, audits in various parts of the country. We've been involved in helping develop a, a draft water loss policy that communities can voluntarily adopt and utilities can adopt as part of their policy manual. We've been involved in a couple of international projects where we do water loss training. And we're also involved on the planning committee for the North American Water Loss Conference, otherwise known as NAL, which is a conference which was first held in Georgia and Atlanta in 2015 in December. And the next conference was very successful. The next conference will be held in December 2017 in California. And we'll have more information about that at the end of the webinar. So because of our interest in water loss, we wanted to make sure it was part of our Innovations and Efficiency Showcase series. And this is a series we've instituted to show the work of our AWE members and the creative work that they've done in managing new trends, emerging technologies, and uh, adopting innovative approaches that we believe are changing the field of water management and making us all more efficient. And because we believe in uh, recovering water losses and reducing non-revenue water, we wanted to make sure we were featuring these programs in uh, this efficiency series, innovations and efficiency series, because we think that these programs help water utilities to improve their own resiliency as they're facing rising price tags for infrastructure and uncertain water availability, um, you know, given climate change. So as part of this, we wanted to focus this webinar on the emerging field of water audit validation and how this new best practice is being conducted in an increasing number of utility systems um, around the world. And you'll hear in this webinar how it's been adopted, how it's becoming part of standard setting in various states. And we're very, very pleased that the presenters that we have uh, for this webinar are among the leaders in this topic. So I'd like to introduce uh, Kate Gasner and Will Jernigan, uh, who will be your speakers for the webinar, and I'd like to turn it over to them. Thanks so much, Marianne. Really excited to be here. My name is Kate Gasner, and I'll be joined by Will Jernigan. Uh, together, we've been working on a lot of different water uh, audit projects and specifically this idea of water audit validation across the country. And today we want to give uh, a pretty broad overview of, of why validation is important, what it is meant to unveil, what it unearthed about water losses and the water audit process, um, and, uh, and a little bit of examples about how it comes uh, into play, how, uh, how that value is actually seen by water agencies around the country. Uh, again, my name is Kate. I work with Water Systems Optimization. Uh, we're based in San Francisco um, and are involved in all things water loss control, uh, as is Will. Uh, Will is um, with Kavanaugh and Associates, and we've been lucky to work together a lot quite recently. My job is to introduce some of the basics of, um, of the terminology and the focus of uh, of what we'll eventually get to around validation. So what is the subject of validation? What are we focused on? Uh, what are the tools that we're working with? Um, and why would we need to validate a water audit? Well, zooming out a bit to start, um, what our original question is for all of these endeavors is what are the distribution system losses in any given utility? And uh, as, as Mary Ann spoke to, uh, there's a lot of activity going on regarding water losses. Um, so this process, hopefully this table, is not too foreign um, to many of you. But I'll walk through it just to get a baseline of understanding about what, what the subject of our focus is. 
our goals in doing a water audit are to understand the total water losses of a system and to understand what types of losses those are. It's a relatively tricky question, given losses aren't a volume, they aren't a, a subject of a lot of our interaction. Um, they are water losses because they're hard uh, to encounter and, and often hard to contain. But our goal is through a top-down assessment of volumes that we do know about to try to get an estimate on the scale and the value, the cost of those losses. We do that through a top-down water audit or a water balance as is displayed on the screen here. And we take our known volumes, the things that we interact with as a utility, our production volumes and our billing volumes or consumption volumes, and we compare those. So starting here on the left of the screen, we start with an assessment of water supply of how much over the course of a whole year does a water utility supply to its system. And we compare that total volume of supply to a total volume of consumption. And we know that all of that consumption is either billed and generating revenue or unbilled and, and part of the operational um, or, or sort of idiosyncratic uh, consumption of a system. And we know that some of it is metered and some of it is estimated. So we have to hold all of those uh, characteristics and, and the consequences of some of those estimations in mind. Once we get that volume, we have this leftover volume, this deduction of water losses. And that's what we then engage with to try to understand where are those water losses happening. Are they at the meter such that we're missing volume that is used, but we're not tracking it? Things like theft or customer meter under registration. Or are they actually physical leakage volumes in our system? And so just as a, a total overview, what we're doing is we're taking known volumes, volumes of supply and consumption, and through this process of elimination, we're deducing those volumes of water loss. The power of this process is that we account for all of the water in our system. As an industry, we've moved on from terms like unaccounted for water because in reality, it's possible to track the ultimate destination of our water supply. And we want to empower utilities to engage with the data sources and the information uh, to supply this kind of ledger of where water is going. But as you can imagine, this process is also completely dependent on those tracking mechanisms that you have at your water utility. So to understand water losses, what we quickly realize is that we depend quite wholly on the accuracy of our production volumes, the accuracy of our consumption volumes, and we realize that the processes and protocols behind those volumes, how we take care of that data, matters in trying to assess our losses. One of the tools that is most useful in doing this process of top-down water auditing is the AWWA Water Loss Control Committee's free water audit software. I'll reference it as the audit software from here on out. That's kind of a mouthful. But what we have is a, a freely downloadable and accessible Excel spreadsheet that facilitates this process of mass balancing. The water audit software collects mass balance volumes and does this comparison alongside with the utility. It just asks for input data and asks for this inventory of what are all your supply volumes, what are all your consumption volumes, how can we start estimating between these types of losses. The other thing the water audit software is it introduces a critical idea, one that we will be focusing on a lot throughout this call. It introduces the idea that in the process of doing this mass balance, we have to hold a difficult uh, sort of in, uh, inquiry. We have to hold the idea of uncertainty. We have to acknowledge that our numbers aren't perfect. And this is a process that requires a lot of the utility, um, a lot of sort of reflection and, and introspection on, on how we know what we know. <laughs> um, and it also requires some amount of of inventorying of your practices and protocols on how you test your meters, how you gather and review your information, what kind of checks and balances you have on the numbers of, of your water flowing throughout your system. The water audit software does that through a data validity grade matrix, where for each input, it acknowledges that, that factors in accuracy and, and integrity of data will change what it looks like to have a good supply volume 
and the practices involved there, it's going to look very different than what it looks like to have a good pressure value and what it looks like to collect information there. So each data validity grade gives some sense of, of uh, what proactive and thorough practices look like and score according to that scale of proactive uh, policies and pros, protocols to maintain good data. That, that happens for every single volume in the audit software. So the user is reminded, not only are we comparing volumes, we're really investigating the accuracy of those volumes. Because of course, as I mentioned earlier, any inaccuracy in our, in our known volumes, our supply and consumption, that's going to follow us through this process of elimination and affect our understanding of losses in the end. So as much as we can capture both um, what we do and don't do in terms of maintenance of our, of our data um, and what we do and don't know about the accuracy of the data, that's what some of this data validity scoring aims to do. That's all in the hands of water utilities themselves. They can download the software and complete a water audit. What we're finding is that uh, to ask a water utility to do that um, sort of in isolation with their own data um, is, a, is a pretty big lift. And through the Water Research Foundation, through a, a, a report that was uh, published, I think, about a year ago now, um, it's been a busy year, um, we reviewed some of the current available data sets on this exact water audit software. So given sort of my, my whole spiel about uncertainty and where uncertainty comes into play and how important it is to acknowledge throughout the audit, we looked across uh, various state programs that had audit submissions and we took a look at uh, the quality of those submissions and tried to understand um, whether utilities were embracing the audit methodology and, and whether their results were looking um, reasonable and appropriate for, for what we expected. Well, it turns out across each one of these states that's collecting on it, a huge endeavor unto itself. Um, but when we turned to the results, a fair number of them were suggesting unrealistic results. I'm not going to go into the details of this reporting uh, unto itself. I'll refer to you to Water Research Foundation publications for, for those details. But to suffice, suffice it to say, we applied some filters to assess the quality of these submissions on the whole. We didn't look at any one audit, and of course each audit is very idiosyncratic. But on the whole, these data sets suggest that we have some, some audits that aren't, um, that aren't reflecting the actual systems they try to describe. For example, we filtered out negative losses, suggesting the utility was selling more than it was producing. We filtered out extraordinary cases of losses of impeccably tight systems or incredibly leaky systems. And in that process, we isolated that a fair number of utilities uh, were finding, were, were going through this process and finding um, some unrealistic results. And in response to that, there's been a lot of conversation, uh, a conversation that Will and I have been uh, steeped in for some time now about how to start improving the value of the audit's results. How do we help and, and facilitate a more rigorous review of the audit process and the data that informs the audit? And this is part of another Water Research Foundation project that is just recently in, in publication process. So it's about to hit your desk soon, I hope. Um, project 4639 about validation in particular. Um, this is one of the things that, that has been in discussion for a while, but but really gives language to part of uh, an important component of water auditing, which is a review of the water audit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about our experience of doing some of this validation work. This helps us navigate some of uh, definitions of validation. Um, and I want to focus our attention on this level one validation. This is what a few states have been uh, doing in the past uh, couple years. Um, specifically, California is uh, midway through a program of ambitious nature to level one validate all of the urban water suppliers in California um, and produce uh, these reviewed um, and, and level one validated audits towards the end of next year. 
Georgia was the pioneer on this front, uh, and Will will speak to some of the outcomes of that work. And we've got Hawaii, who's also signed on um, to a program that will do a similar level one review of their utilities water audits come next year. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of activity um, around this kind of review of audits. But what are we doing in the level one validation? That's really the focus of today's webinar. What we're doing is we, as third party folks who are well versed in a water audit methodology, and have seen a lot of water audits in our work, we're talking to utilities about how their water audits come together. Now, I, I sort of giggled to myself when Marianne approached us about a uh, showcase of innovation, because you may not think a conversation is c considered innovative in today's world of, of technology and, and gadgets. But I would argue that, um, that this has proven to be an incredibly innovative addition to the process of water auditing. When we confer with utilities about where they're getting their volumes from, what data sources they're using, and what practices and protocols they are currently employing to, to maintain data integrity, a lot, of, um, a, a lot of new fun facts about their systems arise and a lot of value in understanding the quality of the water audit results um, surfaces. So specifically, the level one validation goals are to examine inaccuracies in summary data so to take a look one level back behind this, the total number of production volume, for example, and to examine where are there any indications of error in that summary volume, how can we correct, if at all, for those values. And secondly, to make sure these data validity grades, the things that are supposed to give us a sense of how confident we are in our data, make sure those accurately reflect the utilities practices. Other levels of validation uh, require a, a lot more engagement, require a deeper dive into the specific raw data that informs these total that volumes, um, and, and involves a lot more sort of desktop analysis of, of are we using the right data, how can we improve data. That's a step beyond what we've been doing across these different states. And then lastly, level three validation requires that you go beyond the audit itself a bit and you start looking directly at your instruments and you start doing other efforts of water loss assessment as, an another, as another important data point in understanding water loss profiles. Very quickly, this is how uh, some of the water, the level one water that audit validation programs look. Currently, again, California is is about halfway through uh, its technical assistance program that's offering this level one review for water audits throughout the state. Um, it's an educational and um, an instructive experience for water utilities. We have a workshop to start, we connect on the phone, and we're talking specifically about how they got their data and how they've uh, used the water audit. We're just talking specifically about what practices and protocols they have behind the scenes to inform this information. And then we revisit that process in an effort to get documented and, um, and well-examined audits and try to avoid some of these snafus that we've seen in the past. Mind you, we can't avoid all error when it comes to this level of review, and that's something we hope to do today, too, is in our examples delineate what level one validation does and what it doesn't do. And for a bit more discussion on that front, I will hand it over um, to Will. Before I do that, of course, I'll mention that he will address some of Georgia's work and some of the outcomes of their, uh, their pioneering level one audit validation program. They've gone through that process uh, and will point to some of the results of that process. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Will. He'll address some of uh, the elements that we're looking out for and why and how inaccuracy shows up in the audit. That sounds good. Th thank you very much, Kate. This is Will Jernigan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a core question that I think sort of sort of plagues us all. And Kate really uh, teed it up well, talking about the Water Research Foundation 4372, that identified out of the jurisdictions across the country that are collecting these water audits, there's a reasonably 
um, significant portion of the audits that are presenting these unrealistic results. And so the core question that that poses is, why are the why are our water audits not not accurate from the get go? Why why aren't they accurate? of their own accord. And when we examine this question, we, uh, we, we always come back to the, the reliability of our, of our outputs is a, is a direct function being of uh, the reliability of our inputs. So this is a, I mean, intuitively we all understand the, the garbage in, garbage out concept, but what, what really I think is a, is a deeper exploration of that is where exactly does error get introduced into this process? And we recognize that a lot of the information that, that feeds into the water balance is fed from instruments, how we manage the data, and then to some extent how we use that data and then do the math and apply it into the, into the AWWA tool. Uh, I would, I would uh, posture that what we are seeing across the board is that largely uh, there, are, there are inherent issues in the data that it's, it's not, nine times out of ten, it's not somebody uh, doing the math wrong. It is simply these, these uh, persistent things that can, can exist underlying within the data. So that's what I'm going to take a, m a minute or two and talk through what are those things that can contribute uh, inherently to inaccuracy in the data. Uh, next slide, please. As Kate was talking about the water balance, we, uh, we we're looking at uh, where does it begin. It always begins with our system input volume, uh, and then the authorized consumption representing uh, all of our customers as well as any own uses like flushing and fire, etc. So all of those things comprise your authorized consumption. Why this is relevant and important is that these are the two largest volumes in your water balance. So you can imagine anything that might introduce error into these two numbers are going to, by and large, have the most impact on the overall accuracy of your water balance. And keep in mind, your leakage metrics, your apparent loss metrics, those are all coming from your water balance, and they are, are all a direct function of the accuracy of that water balance. Uh, next slide, please. So as we think about what introduces error into our water balance, we're going to reach back about 30 years uh, to, to our friends uh, from the movie Gremlins. And the reason I want to do that is because uh, I think Gremlins gives us the most poignant analogy for what some of these things are, and I'll, I'll touch on these and give a couple examples. You can see them there on your screen. But the, the, the characteristics of gremlins are consistent with the characteristics of those things that can introduce error into your water balance in that, that they are persistent. Uh, oftentimes they are hidden. They are certainly mischievous. Uh, and in the end, they can wreak havoc on the accuracy of your water balance. Uh, so we're going to use that analogy. Uh, for those of you out there that are fans of both movie trivia and water-related humor, uh, also when you get gremlins wet, they multiply. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. One example that we can run into, and this one comes from our friends at Emmy Simpson, a very good example, and I wanted to, uh, to share this one, is the meter installation. Where, where our supply meters are physically installed ends up actually mattering a lot, and it can be a gremlin. In this particular case, a prop meter was installed in proximity to a check valve that created the speed of the water at the bottom of a column to overspeed the turbine mechanism in the, uh, in the meter. And interestingly, the meter had been bench tested at the factory and came in right near 100%, but when, when it was uh, tested on site, it was revealed that it was over-registering by uh, 42%, significant over-registration. And by the way, uh, if you do the math on that, that causes your water loss volumes to present artificially high, very high. So just imagine you're the operator in this situation trying to figure out where in the world all this leakage or loss is happening. And really, it's a gremlin that it lives in, the, uh, in the, the way it was originally installed. At no fault of the operator, at no, nobody's doing the math wrong, this is an inherent issue that's creating that challenge. Uh, next slide, we'll look at another example of, or actually speak to uh, some ways in which we can help to identify. Uh, these are not practices that are part of conducting a level one validation. However, they are relevant because a level one validation seeks to understand to what extent are our supply meters being flow tested for accuracy, volumetrically, hydraulically flow tested, and to what extent are, are the electronic uh, instruments being signal calibrated 
to verify that our signal range and the milliamps coming off of a meter is in most cases uh, is calibrated and is appropriately the data chain is appropriately making its way uh, ultimately to wherever the data lives and gets archived. And by the way, when you go to retrieve production volumes, uh, typically where it gets archived, that, that's the place you go. So the data chain from the meter all the way to where it ends up living uh, forever, that matters. And so calibration is one of the techniques to, uh, to identify potential gremlins that can exist in that data chain. Uh, flow testing is one of the techniques that can be utilized to identify uh, those gremlins like proximity of where the meters are installed. Uh, certainly if you have the gremlin of meter wear, uh, and let's go to the next slide, I think we'll look back at what our different gremlins uh, involved. Another gremlin that we, that we can run into is with how the data gets archived and the communication involved between the meters and our SCADA systems. If you have a SCADA system, it relies on some level of, of uh, communication of those polled readings at some type of frequency. So in this case, we see a gremlin that lives between 4 o'clock and 10 o'clock in this particular day. Water was produced uh, at, at all times during the day. They never shut the water off. What happened at 4 o'clock was something interrupted the uh, power, which interrupted the communication trail uh, between the meter and the SCADA system where it was being archived. So as far as SCADA knows, for that day, there was no water produced in that window, and you can see down at the bottom, the total for the day uh, did not actually align with the true total that was produced as measured at the, uh, at the pump. So this is a, a, a gremlin, and uh, let's agree that this is uh, something that could be hidden, certainly mischievous, and something that certainly could wreak havoc on the, the accuracy of your water balance, especially if at the end of the audit period, the SCADA system is where you're going to mine for these numbers, for the water, the amount of water produced for the year. Uh, according to the SCADA system, uh, if these data gaps exist, then it can give you a uh, uh, deflated value or an understated value for your, your water production. That will absolutely wreak havoc on the, uh, the water balance. So the level one validation seeks to identify what practices are in place and this aligns with the data grades that are assigned to the various water audit inputs. What practices are in place already that help to monitor for and look out for these types of gremlins that can exist and that can introduce error into the process? And so we get back to the, the uh, total look at all of the potential. And by the way, this is not even an exhaustive list, but these are, these are some usual suspects when it comes to gremlins that can introduce inaccuracy uh, into our supply volume, and we talked a few, about a few of those. So if we go to the next slide, we'll look at a couple of, couple of things that pertain to that second largest volume in the water balance, which is our authorized consumption. And here we have a few more uh, gremlin friends that can be introduced. And I'll, I'll start by mentioning the usual place you would go to, to extract this number. And by the way, when, when we're talking about authorized consumption, that's the water that you sell, certainly, to your customers. There are other uh, unbilled uses like firefighting, flushing, uh, operational, things like that. But for the most part, the largest piece of your authorized consumption comes from your billing system. Well, all billing systems are, uh, are helpful, but uh, none of them I, I have ever met in my career was ever designed uh, specifically for the purposes of extracting uh, this, this type of data for water loss analysis. And it's not necessarily the billing, billing system's fault. Uh, billing systems were designed for financial purposes, for billing, and, and most of them actually do, do that very, very well. And they get the financial function executed uh, well and efficiently. But depending on how we ask our billing system for these things, we, can, we, can, we have the potential to run into these types of gremlins where volumes can be duplicated, uh, volumes can be omitted. We can get volumes in there that don't belong in our potable water balance. And then the last one mentioned here, again, not an, ex uh, an exhaustive list, but mismatched time frames can apply to really any and every water utility unless you uh, are on an AMI system that has real-time readings on your customers. Otherwise, you're, you're at best relying on monthly readings Sometimes it's every other month, sometimes it's up to twice a year, 
uh, maybe even once a year. I mean, those are some extreme examples. But in all those examples, the time frame in which we measure supply from our production or our purchased water and the time frames that we measure consumption are, uh, are never different. So that's, that's, that can be a very big deal. So let's go to the next slide and we'll look at some examples of validation activities. I'm going to start high at, uh, at a statewide level across the state of Georgia. They have had uh, the longest running validation program and the experiences in California have been largely informed by those experiences in Georgia. On the whole, um, what I'm sharing, what I wanted to share now is from a validity sp perspective as well as volumes and values of non-revenue water uh, when we go to the next slide. Overall, that the pre-validation and post-validation showed that the validity did come down and what that means is that there was a refinement in how those data grades were applied and better matched up and better aligned the utilities practices with the language and the criteria in the data grading matrix. And what happened interestingly with that uh, was that you could see on that last slide that the, that the changes weren't necessarily dramatic, but there were on the aggregate some, some refinements to the averages and the, and the max and mins on the total data validity score. But more interestingly, the, the statewide aggregate for the volumes and the values, this is what to me is, is the most interesting is before validation before they had been through the validation process if you added up all of the non-revenue water uh, in million gallons and all of the dollars of cost of non-revenue water uh, then versus the post validation results there's a pretty dramatic change from the pre-validation to the post validation and oftentimes what this represents is corrections in methodology uh, sometimes it's as simple as corrections in units uh, or uh, or how they were how they were keyed in, but in most cases it's corrections in methodology for uh, for how those source volumes, supply volumes, and those consumption volumes get applied into the different categories in the water balance, and then uh, and then matched up to how they should apply into the AWWA worksheet. And these are driven the the dollars and the cost of non-revenue water is largely driven by the financial uh, cost calculations which go in. So there's quite a bit of uh, change from the pre to the post uh, audits in this case, and that largely drove it. But that's a pretty, that's a pretty big shift, and so I just wanted to sort of underscore that the, the value of validation is not simply just having a more refined picture, but in some cases it can, it can actually result in a considerably refined picture that would, uh, in other wor in other, uh, otherwise, uh, you would be misguided into what, what levels of loss you might have and what should you do about it. So we're going to now take a quick look at, uh, at the utility level, that same type of uh, understanding before and after of the volumes, the values, and the validity. And I'm going to hit one example and then I'll turn it back over to Kate to share a couple other examples from, uh, from the work in California as well. This one is a case study where before validation they had a data validity score of 84 and through the validation process and refinement of ap applying the data grades uh, to all of the water inputs had a, a significantly lower data validity score and it was simply a matter of going through the process of discussion and airing out what the different practices were and interpreting how those aligned with the criteria in the data grading matrix and how that applied to each input. So a couple of interesting things that, that came out of that. One is a, a better understanding of the overall reliability of the audit uh, because an 84 indicates a very, a very high reliability in the audit and 51 indicates that it's in the middle of the range and that focus really needs to be on improving data in the, in the short term before a tremendous amount of focus is placed on the, uh, on the improvement of losses and the cost of those losses. The other uh, interesting outcome was that there was a fairly significant change in the volumes and, and the graphic we're looking at here on this, this screen is the costs. Uh, those overall costs, you can see total, went from a little over 200000 to a little over $800,000. Uh, total non-revenue water, that's the aggregate of the real losses, the apparent losses, and the unbilled component. So this is quite a different, not only is it a refinement in the data validity score, but quite a different profile with respect to their non-revenue water components. So if you are this utility, um, the, the value of 
going through this validation process is getting an understanding of what areas do I need to focus on, what are my next steps um, in the pre-validation condition. Those next steps would have been, uh, candidly, would have been misguided uh, if, if the pre-validation uh, metrics were the ones that were used. So with that, I'm actually going to uh, pass it back to Kate, and Kate's going to tell us uh, one or two more examples uh, from the California experience, uh, and then we'll move to, uh, to wrap and summary. Great. Thanks, Will. Uh, so here we are with another example. Uh, these are just screenshots of some of the output of the water audit. So we're looking at those final volumes of both apparent losses and real losses along some of those other unbilled volumes as well. Here's a utility, another real case whose volumes did not change. Here, instead of the values, the costs, we have straight volumes displayed. So the balance of the results, uh, pre-validation and post-validation, no corrections were made to the balance of inflows or outflows. No big aha moments were had in the discussion of what data sources are informing this mass balance and how do you maintain those data sources. No volume corrections were introduced. So you'll see that the leakage index is the same and the volume totals are the same. They still have the same losses um, estimated for their system through this process. But what did the validation conversation unveil? Well, similar to the last example, we've got a decrease in data validity score. And I won't harp on, on specifics of, of what those decisions were, but it's worth noting a, a sort of typical example here where pre-validation, um, a utility fills out the audit and is deriving volumes the way they always have, talking to their treatment plant supervisor about summary totals from the year, talking to their finance team about what build volumes um, occurred for the year for their, for their authorized consumption, and then filing all of those in the audit. But in the pre-level, the, the pre-level one validation, there wasn't a lot of uh, reconsideration of where those numbers are coming from in terms of the maintenance and practices that could maintain their accuracy. So in the pre-level one validation case, um, just to focus on one volume, it's very possible to have a, a high data validity grade um, and acknowledge that a utility is doing all they can to maintain integrity of something like production data. Um, if they're testing and calibrating their meters on an annual basis, just the way that Will uh, pointed out as one of the resolutions of some of these gremlins. That kind of practice at least gets us uh, headed in the right direction to, to speak confidently about our production numbers. Well, in this case, that had been the practice for many years, and for one year they did have information about those tests and calibration records so that they were confident in their production number. But that process needs to be an ongoing one to, to hold relevance in the production of good data. So it turns out that that practice of annual testing and calibration was no longer actually done, and that's an example of where we would downgrade or edit a data validity grade to suggest that we don't we no longer have insight to the quality or integrity of that really important volume. So here, the data delay grade decreases. We don't change any of the volumes, but we have a different directive at the end of the day. The pre-level one validation with unedited scores would suggest we both have quite low levels of leakage in the system. The leakage index describes that there's little room for opportunity in the system. Um, in, in that they're close to a very minimum amount of leakage. But a high data validity grade uh, also indicates that that, that that is within the realm of reasonable results. Their, their data is, um, is a good quality given their practices and protocols. When we reduce that data validity score, we cast a little bit more doubt on that quality of data. And that is a valuable process. More, uh, more investigation, or more uncertainty, acknowledging more uncertainty is at play, is critical when considering the results of an audit. So a data validity score of 55 suggests that we actually don't do a lot of these best practices to maintain the, the 
data sources that we have. And because of that, we have to take this result of 1.2, that leakage index, these total volumes, we have to consider these in a slightly different light. We have to say, wow, there's probably more uncertainty. There may even be more gremlins at work behind the scenes. Before we declare ourselves a tight system, or before we take this audit um, and, and swear by its results, we have to investigate some of these data sources. That's the real power of validation, is unearthing those practices and protocols and changing that, that light through which we see the results. Another important outcome that we want to acknowledge uh, here is simply, uh, even if you don't change anything, even if you don't see um, a, a data validity grade score change or a, or a volume change, we're finding the process of documenting how and why decisions are made for the purposes of the audit is a very valuable outcome of level one validation. So here's a snapshot of some of the, the reports we've been producing for our level one validation effort in California. And it really goes through an inventory of where this data came from, what practices are done to maintain its integrity, and what grade corresponds with those practices. That in and of itself has turned out to be an invaluable resource for a utility whose, uh, whose water audit responsibility may shift from one person to the next, whose inventory of practices and protocols um, may differ depending on who you talk to. So this kind of documentation, um, with or without the more tangible changes, is something that we're seeing is a, is a real critical uh, value and, and benefit of having these conversations, having that extra review, those fresh eyes on an audit from a utility. In our closing, uh, what we'd like to remind you of is three of, um, of ideas, three takeaways of what we're finding in the process of doing this validation. Um, we hope some of those examples uh, uh, exhibited some of these takeaways, um, but more broadly than specific examples of changing data validity grades or, or changing volumes of the audit, this is what we're finding in, in working with utilities on their water audits. The value of validation comes in a couple different forms. First, having discussions, asking pretty direct questions about best, source, best data sources to use for the audit and best practices um, that are or are not happening at a water utility. Having those frank conversations is something that, uh, that folks rarely have an opportunity to do about, wow, do we test those meters, those specific meters, on an annual basis? And is electronic calibration part of that process? an opportunity to investigate those questions um, and, and air out some of those uh, realities has been useful. Second, water audits themselves benefit from scrutiny. So it's, an, it, it's easy to think that it's a plug and chug process where you're taking volumes, you're comparing them, and then taking, lo uh, taking a look at your water losses. Well, it, it's a bit more nuanced than that, and there's so many data sources, so many departments, so many um, interfaces at work that it does benefit from more eyes and more conversations in how all that information comes together. And lastly, we wouldn't be doing all of this unless there was some consequence, unless there was uh, an impact. And, and it does matter whether we are taking care of our data sources, our, our meters, our information. It matters because we're turning to that information to get an accurate idea or to get a, an instructive idea about where there is opportunity for revenue recovery, for loss recovery. The better our data, the better that direction is, and that's why we care. Uh, accuracy and embracing of what we do and don't know paves the way for, for water loss recovery uh, and revenue recovery thereafter. Um, so those are some reasons why we're excited about validation. That's why we're pursuing this work across the country. And we're very grateful, thanks to AWE, for the opportunity to, to at least touch on some of the examples that we found uh, in that process. Marianne, back to you. Thank you very much, Kate and Will, for a great webinar presentation. Um, many, many thanks. So we're at the point now where you can ask questions of our speakers. Um, if you click on the red, I mean, I'm sorry, the orange box with the white arrow on it, it'll open up a dialog box 
where you can actually type in a question and uh, our presenters can answer that question for you. Uh, Liam will be reading off the questions in the order that they've been received. Uh, but while you're doing that, I just want to let you know that a PDF of this presentation as well as a link to the recorded webinar will be available on the Alliance website within a few days, so watch for that. Um, in terms of future webinars, our next one will be January 5th at 11 o'clock central. We're going to talk about federal advocacy issues for water efficiency. Um, it's new time, so we need to have strategies that we know are important and will serve uh, the, your needs as well. Uh, we're also going to have a webinar in February on the results of our landscape peak reduction study. And we'll also have a webinar, uh, I think probably in February as well, on our soon-to-be-released uh, gray water study. So uh, lots coming up in early 2017, so stay tuned. But before I turn it over to Liam to answer questions, I um, want to say a few words about the North American Water Loss Conference. Um, and Kate, if you can just flip to that last slide. Um, that conference will be held December 4th and 5th. It will actually probably start Sunday, December 3rd, but it'll be uh, the 4th and the 5th, the 2017, uh, in San Diego at Paradise Point uh, Resort. Um, you can see we have a number of partners. We're, we'll be partnering with the California-Nevada section of AWWA, and um, it'll be a terrific conference. We expect anywhere between five and 600 people if the Atlanta conference in 2015 was any indication. So if this is a topic that interests you, you must come to this conference. It'll be a terrific opportunity to not only hear the latest in terms of water loss programs, but to also network with other professionals who are dealing with the same issues that you are. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Liam, who will read whatever questions we might have received. All right. Yeah, we have a few questions here, and maybe a couple more will trickle in. Uh, so first off, uh, how is California's program paid for? I'll uh, jump in and grab that one, Kate. So the program in California was funded uh, through the State Revolving Fund, which is the SRF uh, program that exists uh, exists in every state, and that was the uh, the source for the money. I think the State Water Resources Control Board uh, ultimately was is the uh, is the is the steerer of that money, and that uh, that was how the, the the program was funded. It went to the Cal Nevada section of AWWA, uh, and then we we were um, selected by the Cal Nevada section. Uh, to execute the program as the program management team. Okay, great. Um, next question. Could a neighbor water utility be used as a third-party validation of the water audit process? All right, Kate, you want to take that one? Yeah, really good question. So the things that we um, encourage as, uh, as sort of validator criteria um, one, I, I like the, the sort of suggestion of the question, which is that you get someone outside of your operations uh, to, to consider these questions of, of data source management and best practices. It's nice to get fresh eyes on some of uh, these things when uh, internally we can keep our heads down um, and, and that new voice is often really critical in the validation process. Um, outside of that, uh, I'll, I'll open up my answer to say that the criteria for a specific validator, um, at least in California, um, those are being developed in part of the rulemaking that's underway and part of Cal Nevada's work, the Cal Nevada section's work right now, is to create um, a, a process of, uh, a, of certification such that there is a standard by which we can, uh, can pursue validation. Right now, uh, that standard is is housed uh, in the in the minds of a few water loss experts throughout the country, and, and we're excited to uh, to share that that workload. Um, and so there will be a few programs uh, in the next coming years in these states where uh, where validation is being pursued uh, to spread the love a little and make sure that that folks can validate either your your as you suggested your neighboring water agencies um, and uh, and engage in that process. A similar 
process of um, initial program offer and followed by that that validator certification was pursued in Georgia. Any additional okay. thoughts there, Will? Yeah, I'll just, uh, just add in two seconds. Uh, Georgia's program does have a certification that, that Kate was referring to as being developed in, in California now. It does exist already in Georgia. Uh, and in that certification program, there's a coursework and an examination by which uh, individuals can become certified to conduct the level one validation. Uh, and it is open to, to all. Um, it's not exclusive to consultants or, or utilities or agency personnel. It's, it's anyone can go through it as long as they demonstrate the competency uh, and pass the test, uh, they can get certified. Okay, great. Uh, next question. How do you differentiate between real versus apparent losses? All right, I'll uh, grab that one, Kate. So that one is uh, that that step to differentiate is a part of the top-down water audit and it is actually part of that, that function is built into the AWWA free water audit software and in general how you do it is by populating the inputs on the worksheet uh, the differentiation happens already uh, but in concept how it happens is uh, applying uh, estimations to the apparent losses through the three primary types which are theft meter under registration, customer meter under registration, uh, and systematic data handling errors. There's three inputs and two of those have a default available and the metering under registration does not have a default. But once you supply that estimation into the worksheet uh, along with your other volumes like water supplied and customer consumption, once you put those volumes in, it segregates total water losses into apparent and real uh, by subtracting off the apparent loss estimate from the total water loss number and the real loss becomes the remainder and that's what's left over. I mention that because it, it is called a top-down water audit uh, for that reason. That the real loss volume, total real loss volume for an audit year equals the remainder of losses after or we take total water losses and remove the estimation of the apparent losses. Then all of that's in the worksheet. So. All right, great. Thank you, Will. Uh, next question, are the ILIs posted somewhere for water loss? All right, Kate, you want to grab that one? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, ILIs are one of the results of doing a water audit. So, um, so they're going to be system specific. They're going to be the outcome of doing a water audit. is uh, is a a summary of um, your of your water losses, and then that specific calculation, which compares that that real loss total, your leakage total, to uh, an expected and modeled minimum amount of leakage uh, for a system of your size and operating characteristics. Though, when you refer to the IOIs. Um, I'm going to interpret that as a reference to some of the state work that's been going on across the board. Um, and some states have, have published uh, those results, um, others have not. Um, I can direct you to the Water Research Foundation's 4372B uh, summary report that we did where we don't exact or inventory all of the IOIs to give you uh, system specific information, but we do summarize what was being uh, found on a data set level in each of those states. Um, so in terms of, of context and a general sense of what are uh, encountered ILIs throughout the state, that might be a good place to start. And Kate, I would just add to that, uh, there are some, some known post places where data sets are posted with ILIs. The state of Georgia has published theirs uh, since 2011 uh, up to 2013, I think is, is the latest that they've got posted, uh, as well as the National Water Audit Data Initiative, which has been managed by the Water Loss Control Committee. It's a much smaller data set, uh, but those are audit results with the ILI, or the leakage index for uh, about 25 to 30 utilities for the last five years across the country. Uh, that's available on the AWWA website. And if you're really ambitious, you can check out Alan Lambert's website, uh, which is a mouthful. It's called leakssuite.com uh, or .org one. And uh, he has international ILIs uh, that he posts there. 
and uh, you can see what the leakage index look look like from across the globe. All right, great. I uh, still have a few more questions to get through. Um, yep. One slide described the different levels of validation. How is a level two or level three validation different from an actual bottom-up water audit? Okay, you want to jump in I'll there? Start, I'll start with that. Um, so level two is still contained to the data that informs a top-down water audit. So a top-down water audit would be, um, again, taking this mass balance approach and using something like the free water audit software to compare your inputs and your authorized consumption. Level two investigates the sources of that data carefully. So you're taking a look at all of the elements of, um, of data uh, from the potential inaccuracy at your testing meters to the potential transfer or translation of information from meter to data archives the way Will was describing. And level two validation, uh, you're pulling all of that apart and trying to investigate what are the best sources of information for specifically the purposes of this year-long review of uh, or consideration of losses. Um, so you're doing things that level one validation doesn't with the data. Uh, you're slicing and dicing it um, in much more detailed ways. Um, and taking a very um, critical and thorough look at all of the data sources. So uh, a, a typical example of that would be to really investigate billing data. And instead of just taking a look at your monthly summaries and making sure it excludes recycled water, non-potable water, making sure there aren't any obvious errors, instead of doing that level one activity, uh, you would do a, a pretty thorough breakdown of how does a billing lag affect my total authorized consumption build and metered value here? Um, how do uh, how do my some how do my bills compare across different customer classes or meter sizes? Is there any reason for suspicion um, of the total volume given those different comparisons? Um, it requires it's still a desktop analysis, but it requires a deeper dive into the data sources themselves. Um, a level three validation, you're exactly right, speaks to bottom-up assessments of water losses. But in this context, uh, those bottom-up assessments are to, in turn, reflect on the quality of your top-down data, if you can follow that, that stream of logic. So a, a leak detection program or a component analysis where you're looking at repair data um, or, or any assessment of field work or meter inaccuracy, you're using that to then reflect on how your data numbers are coming together in the top-down audit. Okay, great. Um, next, we have a request for you guys to talk a little bit about the AWWA WADI project. All right, this is Will. I'll, I'll jump in with that one. The uh, WADI, you know, you know how much we love acronyms. Uh, that's the WADI. It is the Water Audit Data Initiative. Uh, it was launched in 2011 uh, by the uh, the members of the subcommittee on the National Water Loss Committee, that subcommittee that manages the the free water audit software. And we uh, and essentially launched it to uh, begin to collect data and. Put, uh, I should say, collect audits from willing participants, volunteer utilities who might might be categorized as early adopters, those who had been auditing already, and submitted those audits for review by the subcommittee. And that process really was the uh, the forebear for this level one validation that we've been talking about today. That kind of set the stage and um, uh, laid out the the initial framework for conducting the interviews and going through the audit in, uh, in detail of, of source for the inputs, uh, basis of practice for the data grades, how those data grades are applied. Uh, in 2011 was the first year, and it's happened each year uh, since, since then, that uh, 25 to 30 utilities voluntarily submit their, their water audits for a review, uh, for, for a level one review uh, by, the, by the subcommittee on the Water Loss Control Committee. So that data gets put through that validation review, 
uh, it then gets kind of uh, compiled and analyzed for general uh, general trends, uh, some general statistics, an understanding of of uh, where where those statistics fall, uh, and then uh, in a couple of years, papers have been published. Uh, usually each year, those results get presented at AWWA conferences. Uh, it is a relatively small data set, so we have to sort of recognize that. But the uh, the larger intent of that WADI is to uh, look at some uh, some national data on uh, on validated uh, data sets. So interestingly, uh, since 2011, now there's Georgia, now there's California, now there's Hawaii. I don't know, Kate, you didn't mention uh, Hawaii, but they have come online with a validation requirement. So there are quickly becoming large, uh, or, or there will be quickly uh, becoming large sets of validated uh, water audit data uh, that were just not even on the horizon uh, in 2011 when the WADI was launched. Uh, so happy to, happy to answer follow-up question there if needed. Okay, the next question I have is, uh, are there other software solutions to water loss auditing besides the AWWA free software? And if so, how do they compare? I'll, uh, I'll jump in and grab that one, Kate. So uh, cer certainly there, there probably are. Uh, in, in the US, the AWWA free water audit software is recognized as the, as the industry standard. Uh, and it's hard to have a standard if, if you have several versions of, of it. So uh, it's one version. Uh, the, the software itself has evolved. It is in now in its fifth generation, so we're in version five. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's a natural evolution of any tool. With respect to other water balance softwares outside of the U.S., there certainly are. I think um, internationally uh, there, there are some that are commonly used. Uh, the one thing that distinguishes the AWWA version is the data grading matrix and the data validity score. Uh, that is not something that exists in uh, in any other tool that I'm aware of, uh, and so that's that is part of the part part of the strategy with uh, standardization of it as as the tool in in North America. Uh, so that that would be my my general answer is there probably are some out there, uh, but it's not really uh, of the same level of, uh, of scrutiny and standard that is widely adopted like the AWWA software. All right, and the last question, uh, what is the benefit of using NRW for tracking validation? Kate, you want to grab that one? Sure. Um, so I'll speak to, uh, I'll, I'll sort of disaggregate your question. Um, one, what is the benefit of tracking non-revenue water? Um, and, and two, how does validation play into that? So the first question um, is, uh, is one on a lot of people's minds, and I'm, I'm glad you asked it directly. Um, why do we care about tracking non-revenue water? Um, that's a big one, but I'll, I'll suggest some of my favorite reasons to start. Um, one, non-revenue water is a source of inefficiency that is that exists in all systems, so we have to acknowledge that it's never going to go away. Our systems leak, our meters aren't perfect. These are realities of operating a, a water system. For me, the value of tracking it is to understand when it gets out of control. Um, and again, that's not to any one utility's fault. Uh, it's, it's the process and the outcome of having a lot of different things going on in a system and, and many priorities. But when non-revenue water gets beyond a certain amount, it costs the utility uh, uh, more than is, uh, than is cost effective. So if your meters aren't registering all that your, cons your customers consume, or if your pipes are leaking to a degree um, that is beyond reasonable for, you, for a system of your size, those become revenue opportunities. Those become opportunities to tighten up the operations of your system and make sure that you're not losing money in, um, in unnecessary places. Um, so for me, the reason to track on revenue water, to do a process like water auditing from year to year, is to provide an understanding of where there are opportunities to save water, to save money. Uh, and without a tracking, uh, without a consistent 
protocol and, and um, process by which you can track that, it's going to be really hard to distinguish when you deploy resources uh, to, to stop the flow of water through leaks or to, to reinvest in, in some of your customer billing processes. Uh, the tra in, in tracking comes that power of decision making. Secondly, um, the power of validation is, is just as important in the tracking. So we don't want to base our decisions on, um, on, on misguided or inaccurate data. Um, and that's where validation can help utilities identify areas where data needs improvement or their practices around data maintenance need improvement such that they can trust those numbers and the tracking then becomes insightful. Okay, the only thing I would add to that uh, is that validity in and of itself is a metric that can and should be tracked and uh, how valid the audit results are and even even to a great extent the uncertainty. Uh, those, are, those are things that should be tracked and, and you should watch that improve over time hopefully as well. So five years ago uh, we were a whole lot less confident in our information than we are today. Hopefully five years from now we'll be quite a bit more confident in our information than we are today. So I think that in and of itself is a metric that can be tracked, especially for those who are just getting started. Because when you're just getting started, your validity it should be low. It's, it's not, these things don't become accurate on their own. And tracking that and benchmarking where your, val where your validity is when you start is a great way to uh, demonstrate improvement even in the early years. Maybe the first three to five years is just focused on honing in and data improvement. Well, that metric is how you can how you can show that, especially when it comes to sharing that information uh, with others. So, uh, Liam, you said we don't have any more questions. Yep, that was the last one. Okay, so I, I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, I want to thank all of you for hanging in there with us and attending this webinar. Um, we, uh, we've just a little over an hour, so I think we made good on our promise to keep this to about that period of time. Um, if you check out our website, we will have the, um, the webinar posted in, in the resource library. We have a page of AWE webinars and we'll have the PowerPoint and the recording posted within a few days. And um, we will look forward to hosting you on our webinars in the future. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Will and Kate, for a fabulous presentation. Uh, I hope everyone has a happy holiday and we'll look forward to seeing you in 2017. Thank you.